Welcome! This tutorial on R History Data and Research Questions is part of the Querying R History Data on the Web video tutorial series. It is produced in cooperation with the University of Jena and the Project Digital for Humanities Digital Research Methods in Art History. The video tutorial series Querying R History Data on the Web contains various methods of querying, modeling, and analyzing art history data. Today, we are looking at considerations on art history data and research questions. We will first look into the question where to find art history data and what these data can offer in terms of research. We will then look into the two querying possibilities with Sparkle and API and the necessity to model data before they can give telling results. New tendencies in data querying go into the direction of shared querying endpoints. Last, we will look into the topic of data science and research questions. This video tutorial series is about art historical data. So far, we have looked into a variety of sources and querying methods. This overview is of course intended as a brief introduction and a lot more could be said about this topic. Let us for a moment recapitulate where art history data may appear. Art history data are mostly created by two different settings. They either refer to a physical or digital collection, or they were created in relation to somebody's research. Whatever the circumstances, these data can, in theory, be used for further explorations in case the copyright status of these data allow you to do so. Cultural heritage institutions are among the big players of art history data. Both museums and libraries offer a lot of data in a variety of ways, either in their online catalogue, through query methods towards the endpoint of their catalogue, or as a data set on GitHub. These institutions move forward increasingly in the spirit of sharing data and images following an open access policy, which in the end adds also to the volume of open educational resources. Many projects offer data too. For example, the Dutch Golden Agents project is one of these. It offers a variety of tools, a dataset browser and a Sparkle endpoint. This means that the data used for this project is made publicly available for different use scenarios. Each of us may also collect data for different purposes. You could be writing a PhD thesis and along with this collect data on your topic as the basis of your research. This data collection process would then be step by step, and when you believe you have a significant amount of data to provide for a telling result, you may stop collecting. Next you go on and prepare your data, visualize it and analyze it. In the end, you will have to deal with a question if you will publish your data together with your research. In fact, more and more data are published either along with research or as a separate set. In publication platforms like Artistorium, for example, you will find a lot of data and also images. Publishing data means that the data becomes accessible not only through a publication, but also through search strategies and therefore offer possibilities for someone to gain more knowledge or different knowledge than the original publication had intended. Be in mind that also images are data. The digital image itself is built with data and additionally there exists data on the image. Both are often available for querying services, sometimes also with an API or Sparkle endpoint. What kind of knowledge can be gained? There is no easy answer to this question. In the end, the answer falls back on what you can do with the digital humanities. Dealing with art historical data is part of the digital humanities research method. That means that using research methods that rely on the use of your computer or with computational methods, you are able to do a different kind of research than through traditional methods. For example, everything that we have been doing so far in this tutorial series would not have been possible without a computer. And it would not have been possible because you either would have had not have access to this data or otherwise it would have taken an awful lot of time 
and difficult investigations to gather the information with a similar result. Research questions like this can be manifold. You can think either very broad or very specific. Let's say you want to search on bronze objects in London's museums from a certain time and a certain area. You could combine the search also with their provenance data and their exhibition data to then compare it with the situation in Paris in a certain range of years. You could look for a museum's acquisition policy over a certain period of time or search for textiles in a certain fabric from a specific area and period and then go ahead and refine your search for your very precise research topic. These are big questions, but you could likewise go ahead for something quite specific or take an even much larger approach. You need, let's say, a specific textile from a specific decade with a certain decoration and wanted to compare this with the same decoration on ceramics. And of course you are hoping that the museum's tax and deposits are also included in the database query. This list of topics could be endless, either large or small. I don't want to become the advocate for computer-based research, but I invite you to sit down for a moment and reflect how you would answer these questions without the access to museums' databases and datasets. Last but not least, also a technical consideration. Regarding very large or very specific um, approaches, where you need a big volume of data, the steps and how you proceed also depends on your computer's capacity. Bear in mind that sometimes you need to split up queries and combine results later on as a workaround for big data sets approaches. Before we get back to research questions, let us briefly resume what methods we have looked into so far. A variety of cultural heritage institutions and projects offer sparkle endpoints through which we are able to query the internal database. But also Wikidata, the data set connected to Wikipedia, is offering a sparkle service. Sparkle is a computer language that needs to be learned along with ontologies that are on the basis of the queries. We have seen that Wikidata sparkle service is much easier to use than the institutional sparkle endpoints. This is due to the fact that Wikidata relies on one complex ontology, which is their own, whereas museums rely on potentially 10 or 20 different ontologies. It is not only complicated to learn the different variations, but also the more complex syntax that is being used. Furthermore, the number of ontologies is always rising. Although a number of museums and libraries have contributed their data to Wikidata, the quality of data in Wikidata, on the whole, is of lesser quality for research matters, compared to the endpoints of the institutions. The reason for this are mainly two. In Wikidata, everyone can contribute, a fact which is also one of the virtues of Wikidata. Therefore, the data can be much more heterogeneous, because not necessarily inserted by people who have learned how to create them. In cultural heritage institutions, people are trained in cataloging and dealing with data. Additionally, the institutional database is usually more complete and up-to-date. Another variety of cultural heritage institutions and projects offer their data for an API query. Not needing a computer language, this query method is easier to learn than a Sparkle query. But you still need to know about the vocabularies the institution has made available and additionally each endpoint also has its own characteristics. For the time being, most of these endpoints, either Sparkle or API, has its own set of rules, although there are now also investigations into sharing endpoints among a variety of providers. We will come back to this later. We have also seen that API queries follow different approaches when using the API string with the URL or when used through mediating engines like Jupyter Notebook that comes with a set of applications. Jupyter Notebook helps to build more complex queries.
Vocabularies for API queries are often not very refined, but they allow to frame a data set which can be subsequently worked with. Your query depends on the granularity of the ontologies or vocabularies the individual endpoint provides. Another method to obtain data could also be web scraping, but this does not necessarily reach the internal database. The institutions prefer you to use their endpoints instead of scraping methods. And please bear in mind that many IIIF images providers increasingly offer these images also for API and Sparkle queries. Always consider some general questions. Before you start querying an endpoint, you need to reflect what kind of information the database contains and what it offers to the query. This is necessary because the kind of research questions that you may develop depends on this. Your research questions can either follow the availability of information in a dataset or you adjust your method to achieve what you would like to know. It is therefore likewise a good idea to start by roughly filtering the data via the endpoint and work with a raw result in another more refined step. In whatever way you are working with data, through an endpoint, with a data set from GitHub, or collecting your own data, or with other availabilities, you always need to model data before you continue to work with it. No visualization and analysis are possible without this step. We have seen OpenRefine as one of the possibilities how you can do this. Another possibility would be the computer language R. When modeling data, you should be in mind that your research question is. You may want to filter the data set first, get rid of categories you don't need before you start modeling. Let us come to new tendencies. We have seen the complexities of single endpoints where you always need to study the given situation of a single institution. And this goes for both Sparkle and API queries. But there are good news. Several institutions are forming consortia to share endpoints. The benefit of this is also not only the fact of the synchronized rules, but also the quantity of data available with just one search. In theory, you could of course go and combine endpoints in a query, either for two Sparkle queries or two API endpoints, and there are ways to do so. But the endpoints would not necessarily follow the same rules, and therefore the quality of data you get as a result could be tricky to deal with. The efforts to create these data hubs are usually driven by cultural heritage institutions. Of the several consortia enterprises that are currently underway, I will only mention two, Pharos and Archives. Pharos is a consortium of 14 international photo collections that share one Sparkle endpoint. Archives is a consortium of currently six international archives with a shared Sparkle endpoint. These institutions and collections share that they are built around an important art historian. Both projects are based on knowledge graphs with complex ontologies that allow for refined searches and complex results. These common efforts are promising tendencies in the cultural heritage world. Although both endpoints are still in beta versions and will take time to get going, they will add significant possibilities for future art historical research. The topic of Consortia Data Hub is actually very broad and I won't go into all, into all the details. Beyond the cultural heritage institutions, we would also need to keep an eye on national projects where research data can be kept in open and sustainable ways. I will only list them briefly. For reasons of complexity, they are not part of this tutorial. You may have recognized that art history research, which is based on data, offers other possibilities than traditional methods. It comes as a very useful addition, especially if you are interested in questions on provenance, exhibitions, conversation reports, acquisition policies, tendencies, quantitative and qualitative analysis, and so on. 
It ultimately depends on your interests and research topics. There are many ways how you could add data science to a traditional topic and search sideways for other insights into a topic you are dealing with in a hermeneutical approach. Or you start by applying data science first, get an overview of a topic or area, and thereafter interpret the findings in the realm of iconology, hermeneutics, patronage, or whatever applies. It goes without saying that this kind of art historical data science cannot substitute the knowledge of traditional art history, as you need to be able to judge and evaluate what you get as a result and where this leads to. You need to approach data critically, and this goes for all steps, the querying, the modeling and the analyzation. Reading data critically requires a knowledge in how data is built, also technically, and what it contains, the subject. Both sides of art history go here hand in hand. The core questions of art historical research with data science are therefore, what kind of data do you need for your research? Which database or dataset, institution, project, etc. is offering the data that you need? What kind of filters, queries do I need to apply? How do I need to model the result in view of my return dataset and often in view of my research question? How can I interpret best my result and how can I frame it? How can I anchor it in an art history? For all these steps, you need a solid knowledge in art history topics. If you don't collect your own data, set cultural heritage institutions are always a good point where to go. As we have seen, there are the big players when it comes to art history data, and on their end, a lot more will happen in the near future. I wish you good luck with your research, and I will be happy to find out what you have done in bridging the two art historical fields of traditional art history and digital art history.